Hi, everyone. Good evening and welcome to the Fairtrade Campaigns workshop at PowerShift. Uh, it's great to be here with you tonight. I know we've got a few people still coming into the, the waiting room um, and we were just talking with uh, Akila here at PowerShift who was saying that it might be a small group of us tonight, um, so in a little bit more of an intimate setting. Um, but we're still excited to be here sharing with you and getting some information out about fair trade and intersectional organizing. Um, and we've got some some questions and food for thought around racial justice, climate justice, and intersections with fair trade. So thanks for being here. Um, we are recording uh, this session, and so the PowerShift team has asked us to. Um, let you all know that they will be using the recordings um, in the future, sharing that with folks that couldn't be here today. So if you're not comfortable um, being on video um, and being recorded, then, then do have your video turned off. Um, otherwise, feel free to, to pop on video with us here. And since we are such a small group, we'll no doubt wrap up early um, today. So we'll do a, a shortened, uh, abridged version of our, of our longer workshop. Um, and with that, um, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Kylie and I am the Senior Manager at Fair Trade Campaigns. And we are a national advocacy organization working to promote fair trade across the US. And we're also part of a global network of fair trade campaigns around the world. And my role is really in supporting our advocacy and outreach efforts across the, the United States. Um, and I have the great privilege of working with our, our regional fellows, two of which we have here co-presenting. Uh, so I will let Kenya and Holly introduce themselves. And then since we are a small group, it would be wonderful to hear from you all too, um, you know, why you're here. So as they're introducing themselves, I'll throw up the PowerPoint right now with some questions for intros. Thanks, Kylie. Hi, everyone. My name is Kenya Reeves. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm located in St. Louis, Missouri, and I am the Great Lakes Region Fellow. Um, so as a fellow, we look over our campaigns in all um, of our universities, our towns, um, congregations, um, and just help them navigate through our fair trade mission and our fair trade goals. And my name is Holly Francis. I use she, her pronouns. I am based in Burlington, Vermont, and I am the Northeastern Region Fellow. Um, and I will hand it back to Kylie, or if anyone wants to introduce themselves, please feel free to either voice it or just throw it in the chat. Thanks, Kenya and Holly. Before we go around for intros from the rest of the attendees here, I will also add, I also use she, her pronouns. Thank you for, for um, calling that um, um, piece to the, uh, the, the list of intro pieces. Um, anyone else want to introduce themselves or you can put in the chat. We have um, a couple questions here. Let me share my screen. Just name and location. Um, what org or campus or um, group are you affiliated with? And then also uh, why this session? Just a, a quick uh, you know, note on why fair trade and what, what, what brought you to this session today? This is Akila. I'm happy to help kick things off. Um, my name's Akila. I use she, her pronouns. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm on staff with the PowerShift Network and was really excited to get to support this session in particular just because I feel like fair trade isn't a piece of organizing work that I know a lot about, but I know that it fits into so much of the other work that we're doing. And if we want to actually like transform our economic systems into like circular economies that aren't run by oil barons and extractive uh, extractive capitalism and like fair trade is a is a big part of that. So I'm excited to learn both a little bit about uh, a little bit more about fair trade and like what the organizing around that looks like in this moment and also just about uh, the fair trade campaigns and kind of the way that that y'all are structured and, and kind of the organizing work that you do. So excited to be here.
And Kenya, I see some chats popping up. Um, do you want to read off for us who else we have on the call? Yeah, so the first one is Rebecca. Um, I'll just read it um, from word to word. Um, her pronouns are she, her. Uh, hard to do quickly. I've followed fair trade since I was a kid and I'm 55. That's awesome. I'm a sociologist focused on social movements and university community collaboration on sustainability. Great. Uh, correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but Shoji, he, him pronouns. I'm tuning in from California, just here as an individual wanting to see the description for this. I was curious about how fair trade uh, efficacy intersects with the climate and racial justice work. And then Shia. Hey, all, my name is Shia. They, she pronouns, currently based in Seattle, um, but soon headed to the Midwest. Awesome. Where are you headed out in the Midwest? Um, I am here because I'm really interested in fair trade approach to reworking global trade towards a more just system. And then... She also says coming to this from commitment to environmental work centered on international solidarity, anti-war work. And then we have San Jana, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, pronouns are she, her, based um, on Kikutin land in what's now called Virginia, awesome. Here from Earth Hacks and just interested in learning more about different types of advocacy. I think that's everybody. Awesome. Thanks, Kenya. Appreciate that. And welcome, everyone. Um, we're happy to have you all. Was there one more, um, Kenya, that popped up that I just saw? Franklin, he, him, and Lana, Alanto, um, learn more. Cool. All right. Um, so let's dive in. Like I said, you know, we're, we're, we're a, a smaller group, um, but, you know, I think that actually uh, it is a nice thing because it lends itself to more um, intimate uh, discussion and understanding around um, around fair trade and some of the content we're excited to share with you all. Um, so before I dive in, um, Akila, can you see um, the the slide okay or am I blocking it with the screen share bar here? Nope, it's showing up great for me. Okay, great, perfect. So before we um, open up the call and we dive into the content and kind of the what is fair trade and, and Kenya is going to run us through our organizing model, we want to hear from you, you know, what are some of the similarities you've seen in your work. Um, I wanted to just level set and the chat's another really great place to to just kind of um, stream of consciousness put in these answers there's no, um, you know, there's no right or wrong. Um, what does fair trade mean to you. When you hear fair trade, what do you think first? I always love to just gauge an audience's, um, you know, new audience like Power Shift's um, take on this. What fair trade products are you familiar with? Do you know already? And then um, what are the three pillars of fair trade? If anyone um, knows um, and has heard kind of what the three main goals of, of fair trade are. Again, like maybe what the three things that come to mind when you think of fair trade. Um, so just take, you know, a couple, two, three minutes to, to answer these in the chat um, and Kenya can, can read them off. If anyone wants to just unmute and speak up too, happy to hear from you that way. So Akila says that um, she's seen fair trade coffee and clothing most often. Um, she uh, agrees with that. I associate fair trade with tea and chocolate products. Yes. <laughs> I 
Any others coming through the chat, Kenya? Not that I see on my end. Oh, here we go. Uh, Rebecca, fair prices, respectful relationships, stable market, often long-term and personal relationships, coffee, chocolate, gift items, and recently expanded tremendously clothing, sheets, linen, other household goods. Awesome. Yeah. That's some, some exciting new developments in fair trade that Rebecca is talking about. Kenya and Holly, do you both want to um, share on this one? I mean, I know in your roles as the fellows, you've had a lot of time to, to sit with these questions. Yeah, so um, just for me, I've grown up with fair trade products in my house. Um, and then when I was a um, senior in college, I went to a sustainability conference um, called AISHI, which some of you might have heard of. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I ran into the fair trade booth there. Um, and that's actually how I got the fellowship. Um, they posted on the AISHI li job listing site um, for the fellowship and I applied. So, yeah. I had a little bit of a different experience. I didn't really grow up knowing too much about fair trade in general. Um, I actually discovered it basically for the first time in college when I went to school and they already had a campaign there. Um, basically for me, I think fair trade just in general inhabits the like being more of an ethical and sustainable consumer and supports people along the way. And so it's like a really good mixture between environmental and social justice. And that's kind of what led me to really latch on to it. It's, it's just very interconnected. Um, and that's kind of what led me to this fellowship as well. Um, so yeah, super cool. Awesome, thanks. So let's dive in. Um, let, I'll spend a few minutes talking about the Why Fair Trade. I'll kick it over to Kenya, who will dive a lot deeper on our organization, our organizing model, and, and what we're calling, I'm sure many of you are calling your own pandemic pivot, you know, how we really um, approached the last year um, with COVID disrupting our, our work and, and all of our lives. So really, why fair trade to start, you know, uh, Poverty is a global problem. There's no surprise um, to anyone on this call um, that the, the, the task at hand in, in solving global poverty really is insurmountable. I mean, it, we have a, our work cut out for us. Of course, we also know that a lot of the issues that Power Shift is focused on this year um, and a lot of the issues we all care deeply about around climate and racial justice um, cannot be achieved and cannot be um, you know, solved for if folks are struggling with the basics of how to provide, um, you know, food and water and shelter for, for themselves and their families. So, you know, about 1.9 billion people living in poverty today, according to the World Vision, um, last year these stats, well, 75% or so work in farming and agriculture. So, you know, decades ago now there was this um, concept emerging around fair trade where folks were asking, well, you know, if we can provide not uh, handouts. Um, right, but but actually empower and provide the tools and 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 systems of justice and, and systems of, of fair trade to artisans, to workers, to farmers, to be able to get a fair price for the products that they're producing, for the labor that they're that they're um, that they're participating in. Can we can we move the needle um, on on global poverty in terms of specifically farmers? So that's really where um, the original kind of idea for fair trade came from, and particularly around artisans making like craft items and and coffee. Coffee was one of the founding um, products in fair trade. So what is fair trade at the core of it? Um, you know, this economic, social, and environmental. So we have these three pillars of, of fair trade and, you know, really the fair trade system is based on these strict standards um, for working environmental conditions, ensuring that farmers are treated fairly. So across these three pillars and the land is harvested sustainably. So each fair trade product that you find on the shelf with the fair trade certified label, uh, which there's a few of that we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, you can rest assured that it was um, certified according to these standards. So 
a lot of people, I think, when they think of fair trade, they think economic, right? They think economic justice, fair wages. Um, and certainly that is a huge, huge piece of it, right? Making sure that there's a minimum price guarantee. This is really important for very volatile markets like coffee. Um, coffee, really the market is up and down. Um, and there's been a coffee price crisis actually for the last um, several years where the price of coffee has actually fallen um, just below and just over $1 um, per, per pound of coffee. And that is in no way um, sustainable for the cost of production. So for example, with fair trade, you have $1.40 um, is the minimum price for, for fair trade coffee per pound. And then an extra 20 cents if that farmer, um, that producer organization is certified as organic as well. So that really does add up a lot over time and can be um, a real differential in, in the ability to be able to have the additional funds that you need, um, again, to support yourselves and your families. So minimum price guarantee, that stability in volatile markets, contracts being honored, access to financial records, um, the community development funds we'll talk about in a minute. That's kind of what I call the fair trade difference. The social aspects, uh, many of you will be familiar with these and, and they might not be surprising, you know, no child or forced labor, no discrimination. Um, so a lot of times uh, fair trade organizations, uh, for example, give more of a voice to women, right? And we see a lot of um, leaders who are, who are women um, in fair trade organizations. And actually um, this picture here that I chose for the opening slide is one of the, the you know, reasons why I'm in this work and what I think of when I think of you know, why I'm in this session, what fair trade means to me. This is a group of women, three generations that I had the chance to meet with in Ecuador uh, three years ago that have all been farming on the same plot of land in Coco, um, which is a very, very male dominated agricultural industry in a lot of Latin and South America. And so, um, you know, they were talking about just how empowering and what a difference it's made to be able to take control of, of their livelihoods and of, um, you know, the direction of their family and be able to have this, um, this um, you know, cocoa production um, that has really been able to fuel a lot of changes, um, not only for them and their family, but in, in the wider community. Um, and again, in a space where you know, men have been very, very center um, um, to that, to that um, process. So that's something that for me has been really important with fair trade. And then as well, you know, training on safe chemical handling, use of protective gear, right? So especially in industries that are a lot more highly um, polluting or dangerous like to work in, um, apparel is actually one of those that you wouldn't think of, but like clothing factories, um, as well as very arduous and labor intensive um, agricultural commodities like banana harvesting or coconut, right? So making sure they have safe um, gear and then environment. This is last but certainly not least. Um, you know, preservation of local ecosystems, measures against climate change. We all know that climate is the um, issue of our time. I mean, the climate crisis is is looming. It's here, and we know that small farmers will be the ones that are affected first and foremost by by climate change. So, ensuring that. Um, you know, again, you have the ability and the bandwidth more to focus on climate mitigation in your community and measures against climate change if you're able to put food on the table and feed yourself and your family, right? So the economic piece has to come before that environmental piece. But there's parts of fair trade standards that include like proper waste management, no agrochemicals, no GMOs, shade grown coffee, right? Like preventing deforestation. These things can all really add up in order to ensure that the local ecosystem is being preserved. And then the community development funds, like I said, this is really what I look at as the fair trade difference. Um, what, what this is, is for the sale of every fair trade product you have, a certain amount of money that goes into a fund for the producers of that product, uh, the farmers, the cooperative members to decide what to do with. These are just a few examples of successful projects that we've seen, um, but they are by no means, <laughs> all of them are an extensive list. So one of the examples that I do point to, I see a lot um, in Latin America and South America, especially is school uniforms. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, there is a requirement that you have to have a school uniform to attend school. Um, you know, we might not think it's a, a high cost here in the US, um, but it's actually an exorbitant cost um, for, for the, some of these farming families. And so using their premium funds from the fair trade production of the coffee that they're selling, um, or in this case in the Ivory Coast, the cocoa, 
to be able to buy uniforms, um, not just for the, the students of the children of the farmers, but of um, the entire community oftentimes. That's where we see this ripple effect. Some of these other pieces, scholarships, we've seen um, examples of scholarship funds a lot for students to be able to attend school who otherwise could not. That also ties back to preventing child labor, right? So how do we get to the root causes of some of these problems that seem so insurmountable like child labor by giving alternatives, by giving um, um, you know, farmers and producers the alternatives that they should have access to? environmental training, organic certification. So again, deciding to you know, um, pursue the organic cert with the funds from fair trade. Healthcare, this is a big one. So having um, healthcare facilities built where there just were none before, you know, having to you know, potentially drive um, miles to get to a hospital to be able to you know, um, deliver, deliver your baby versus being able to do that in the, in the community itself dental clinics where there were none, um, things like that, infrastructure, schools and bridges and roads. I mean, wells and, and water access has been a really big one as well that we've seen. Um, and access to credit. This one's really important, especially with climate change. We've seen harvests slashed and yields decline dramatically due to things like coffee rust um, from warmer temps and things like, um, um, uh, 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 there's another similar issue from climate that affects cacao plants and, and cacao pods, uh, chocolate. So being able to have access to credit and extra financial um, resources in years where those yields have been lower has been really important as well for, for the um, sustainability of the, of the farmers. How fair trade works. So um, I won't spend too much time on this because I don't wanna to get too much into the weeds, but essentially, at Fair Trade USA, where Fair Trade Campaigns is housed, and Kenya will talk to that in a minute here. We certify farms, we inspect and audit them against fair trade standards, and ensure that they are meeting the standards that we um, talked about on the previous previous slide. Traders are registered, so that's really how we trace and measure the impact. You know, the folks that are bringing the products into the U.S. Brands have to be registered to sell forward fair trade, so you know that they are, um, you know, again providing. Um, the impact stories, engaging customers, and we advise them on supply chain development as well. Highlighting at retail. So, you know, really you could certify all of the fair trade products in the world. Uh, we could have, you know, um, millions of producers that we work with that benefit from fair trade. And yet, um, if the products are not um, highlighted at retail and on the shelves and accessible for consumers and being purchased, well, then it's all for not, right? So this one's really important. How do we advertise for fair trade in store? And how do we get fair trade into places where um, it can be accessed, um, accessed more easily and, and more broadly, right? How do we get fair trade into stores that people are shopping at in large cities, you know, in food deserts, um, in places where, um, you know, there's, there's limited access to, to fair trade already? How do we change that? And last but not least is engage consumers. So raising awareness through PR, through social media, through grassroots outreach. That's the work that we do at Fair Trade Campaigns. It's the work that um, you know gets me out of bed and to the computer at my home office every morning. Um, and I think that we have a lot of work to do in terms of how we advocate and how we um, raise awareness around fair trade. But it's definitely the exciting piece um, for me here. And then these are just the labels that you might see on fair trade products. So the two in the middle, this one's our, our current um, label of Fair Trade USA. You'll see that a lot. This is the old one. You might see it sometimes. Fair Trade International, another common label. The World Fair Trade Organization, they more work with producers who are um, um, operating um, outside of the US and like artisan context, especially um, crafts and help to provide support for them, their membership organization, as is the Fair Trade Federation, also membership organization for, for artists and crafts and goods. And then Fair for Life is another one. So they're a, a smaller certifier, but you'll also see that label in the US too. But most of the time you'll see this one in the middle. Great. And with that, I want to kick it over to um, Kenya. Nope. And she will take us through Fair Trade Campaign's mission and a little bit more about the scope of our work. Thanks, Kylie. Um, I'm kind of just going to read off of this slide. Um, so this is our mission. Fair Trade Campaign's is a powerful grassroots movement 
mobilizing thousands of conscious consumers and fair trade advocates on campuses and communities across the US. Um, we drive impact for producers around the world through increasing purchasing of fair trade products, both individually and institutionally, um, and raising awareness for those products. Um, we are part of a global effort to normalize fair trade as an institution, no practice, and consumer preference across 30 countries on six continents. Thanks. Um, so just an overview of what fair trade campus or campaigns are. Um, right here, we're showing a map of you know, where our campaigns are located in the United States. Um, we have 300 campaigns across the country. Um, our campaigns, um, both the college and universities are going to be our largest and fastest growing. Um, it's around half of the campaigns that we have currently. Um, some of the major campaigns that we have right now are um, LA, Chicago, Philly, Houston, um, and then that's our fair trade towns. And then for our fair trade camp, uh, colleges, universities, um, places like UCLA, UC Berkeley, Arizona State, Michigan State, um, and those are just a couple to state off. Um, for our two main pillars of our work, um, or just our goals in general, um, we want to impact through our purchase, um, and we also want to educate. Um, so a lot of our campaigns universities will sell fair trade products um, in their dining halls um, or you know somewhere in um, a union that they have at the campus. Um, and then they our campaigns um, will do a lot of educational events throughout the year. Um, and that's kind of one of their organizing principles is collaboration, partnerships, um, and meeting people where they're at. Um, so we want to build a team and we want to source these fair trade products um, and we want to host these events and pass a resolution. So right here is our organizing model as I kind of went over just there. Um, so our goal one is just to form the committee itself. Um, and then our second goal is just to make the fair trade products available on campus. As I was stating earlier, um, a lot of them will put them in their dining halls um, or throughout the campus. Um, our third goal is to use the fair trade products in the university offices, meetings, and events. Um, so a lot of my campuses um, and universities will host an event um, where they'll bring, you know, a couple of a fair trade coffee or um, fair trade chocolate um, to give to um, the people that do show up their event when things were not virtually. Um, and then our fourth goal is to um, do fair trade education awareness um, raising and growth of fair trade just on the campus. Um, so we want to hit a goal of um, a certain target throughout um, the campus, um, depending on how large the campus is. Um, and then our fifth goal is to develop a fair trade resolution. So with the resolution, we want to make fair trade um, an impact on campus that will stay on campus. And so for our pandemic pivot here, um, as you all know, March 2020 was when things really just shifted entirely for us. Um, so before that was like before I was on, they had a 2020 national conference in person that was going to be in LA. Um, and so when everything happened and everything had to go virtual, they made the conference virtual in 10 days. And they were one of the first, um, you know, organizations to do something like this. Um, so then in spring 2020, um, all of our resources went more um, digitally and this got our campaigns to engage um, more virtually um, as their lives were going virtually. Um, and so then in summer 2020, whenever I came on, we had our um, campaign goal revisions. And so this was just to help our campaigns reach these five goals that we have intended, um, but making them 
um, revising them to do so virtually. Um, yeah, so right here with the resolution, you know, just writing something up that you can collaborate virtually with um, a chancellor on your campaign or on your university um, or a president in your university to do so. Um, and this just helped um, our campaigns reach these goals as COVID was just changing our lives. Kylie, if you can go back to that, thank you. Um, so then for fall 2020, we did our fair fall. Um, and this was just a way to keep engaging our campaigns. Um, we did uh, a lot of events um, virtually. Um, we also um, put out our racial hub that is on our fair trade campaigns um, site right now. And we kept that going into spring 2020 as well. Um, and so that's kind of one of the things that we're doing um, now, as I speak to you on PowerShift, um, we gave our fellows um, a monthly theme that they could engage with campaigns um, that we have in the United States. Um, and whatever that theme was for the month, um, we would do events around that or um, promote things, um, sorry, promote things um, like virtually. So my month was April and, and I wanted it to be more of a sustainable advocation. And so we did a little event um, where we wanted people to do a little TikTok video, like no more than a minute um, of what their campaigns are doing sustainably um, and send that in to us. And we were going to um, promote it on our socials, but also give away a couple PowerShift tickets and then also promote um, PowerShift that we are presenting at now, but also um, just promote our campaigns, other campaigns that are doing um, sustainable advocation. And so um, with discussion like we had before, we kind of wanted to keep that going here. So how has your work pivoted um, among the pandemic? What co uh, commonalities do you see with fair trade campaigns model? Um, and then how can fair trade campaigns engage our advocates digitally in more fun, fresh, interactive ways coming out of the pandemic. So like I stated before, um, the power shift uh, giveaway, we didn't have as many videos sent in as we would like to. Um, so where do you guys see us um, engaging more, um, especially to the youth, which they are a big um, factor in climate advocation and climate justice currently. And Kenya, I know we have a question in the chat that popped up too. Um, so I can't see the chat, but we can read that off and, and answer any other questions too. Please keep them coming. Uh, we definitely want to get to folks' questions. So put them in the chat as you go. And then um, Kenya, maybe you want to read the responses that come in. And again, folks, feel free to you know unmute yourselves and, and share there too. Kylie, would you like me to go over this question right now, since it's kind of around our, you know, campaigns university and um, yeah, safety? absolutely, yeah. yeah. Let's answer any questions folks have um, on on uh, the organization and our model, and then would love to hear anyone's answers to these. Um, and again, even if it's a short answer in the chat, you know, we're really interested in learning from you all as much as communicating, uh, you know, about our work to you. So. Yeah, so Rebecca asked, um, have we collaborated with the sweatshop free apparel campaigns on college campuses? Um, she said, it seems like there could be some opportunities for cross pollination there. Um, yeah. That's something I've never actually heard about. So if you wanna take that away, Kylie. Yeah, we have, um, you know, here and there where it makes sense. So, you know, a lot of our campus campaigns will come to this work from all kinds of different places, right? So it might be students for, sustainability at Iowa State. It might be, 
you know, the students to abolish sex slavery and anti-trafficking organization at like University of Nevada, Reno. Um, and, and the sweat free movement's definitely been a part of that. So yes, um, and it's Fashion Revolution Week, which I should have said at the beginning of the call, um, but this is the global week of awareness around, um, you know, fashion, um, sustainable apparel, ethical apparel, um, and justice for, for factory workers around the world. So we're doing a lot of work right now to communicate about that, as I know the sweat free movement is as well with the Global Fashion Revolution Org. But yes, there's been a lot of buzz, especially in the last few years as fair trade apparel grows and you can get fair trade certified t-shirts and denim at Target now. And you, know, you can have um, um, more access to being able to find sustainable and ethical apparel. Um, we've certainly collaborated with with some of those groups. It's also really how this work was started, I would add to in some ways, like students, um, the sweat free um, students against sweatshop SAS. I mean, that was a lot of the organizing and energy that first came, um, you know, a decade or so ago and kind of spurred, I think, a lot of the fair trade campaigns we see now. Also, just to add to that, I think what's great about campaigns in general, at least fair trade campaigns, is that basically any group can take it on. So whether it be tangentially um, relevant or super relevant, like sweatshop free apparel campaigns, um, any group that finds it interesting can take it on and make a difference that way. Um, it's not like a specific group and it doesn't have to be specifically just fair trade campaigns if that makes sense. So it can be kind of housed in whatever different little group or committee that they want. Thank you. And if you all don't mind, I'll ask a follow-up question. I, I don't want to take you too much off topic, but I've, I've followed the, um, the SAS movement and campaigns and also talked with a number of students who've worked with on those campaigns at some of the colleges and universities around Atlanta. And there were a lot of um, kind of logistical problems with sourcing and, and ending up uh, having apparel orders that were delayed and that were not high quality and things like that, um, which, you know, is, is probably something that is changing over time as, as fair trade is becoming more widespread in the apparel industry. So my, my question is whether you all are also able to help universities with that sourcing uh, to make it a little bit easier for, you know, say an office of campus sustainability that wants to really make sure that they're doing the best job that they can when they source their own t-shirts um do are, are you able to point folks toward uh you know the best possible fair trade sources for that or is that kind of still a work in progress thank yeah you. it's a good question it is rebecca right yes thank yeah. you yeah, we, we are, and it's changed a whole lot, right? So like I said, I mean, I really look at um, Students Against Sweatshops and, and a lot of the, the energy there, you know, again, it, a lot of that organizing was happening, um, you know, even a decade ago on campuses and so much has changed. I mean, there was no fair trade certified apparel um, really, you know, back then and, and the fair trade factory program at Fair Trade USA was, what um, didn't exist yet, it was just, I think, being developed. So yes, we're able to provide some more support on sourcing. A lot of our um, campaigns will decide to get fair trade t-shirts for, you know, the incoming students for sustainability or the eco reps on, on campus, you know, for the year. Um, fair trade uniforms even we've seen in, in dining halls in some cases. So now what we see is that there are a couple companies that are able to deliver in terms of customizing too you know a lot of schools want their logo on their fair trade certified t-shirt so yeah that's something that you can reach out to us directly and we can give some ideas there but there are a couple companies that come to mind that we've worked with that um, are able to they source from fair trade factories themselves and then they're able to um, you know do like custom logos and, and such um, and that's like usually 100% um, organic cotton as well so it's changed a lot and I'm happy to see the change 
and then macro looking kind of out big picture, you know, just it being able to access fair trade apparel again, like in more um, kind of, you know, conventional stores, right? Like being tar Target now carries fair trade denim, right? So we didn't have that even years ago, but yeah, it's a great question. And I know there was some pain points in the beginning. What we hope to see is fair trade apparel expanding even more and to different, um, different, uh, you know, types of apparel and lines, but yeah, we've seen a good, a good uh, level of interest around sourcing at, at, particularly at college campuses, which is exciting. Kenny, is there anything else in the chat coming through on, on these couple questions specifically, or should we move on to the next section? Yeah, I was just about to say, I don't see any more in there. So if you'd like to move on. Okay, great. Um, and we hope that these questions can serve as kind of, you know, thought pieces for you all um, as you move forward to, and especially as Akila said at the beginning with this being recorded and folks can maybe watch it with their team or with others. So they can put a, put a pin in these for sure. Um, so fair trade and racial justice. So I, I want to spend a little bit of time on this and talking about our work to date um, on racial justice and fair trade. Um, and I want to ask some questions to you all as well. Um, so the, the main piece that we have worked on um, specifically in the past year you know, as with uh, many organizations and individuals, we were absolutely um, rocked by, by the murder of George Floyd last spring. Fair trade campaigns had had um, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion as part of our, our work and our strategic plan and our principles for, for several years. But we, like many others, decided that we had to be more vocal. We had to really think about how this plays into our work and how we can align better and more clearly um, with, with racial justice efforts. So what came out of that was initially a team of fellows that we worked with last year um, that um, what came before Kenny and Holly, they put together what we're calling our, our racial justice and fair trade hub, where we have some resources that they did help design for us on how fair trade ties to racial justice and the connections that can be drawn there. Um, so this is something that we, we promoted last spring into the summer and we're continuing to promote it. And I'll open up a couple of these resources in particular that I think have been very useful. Um, but we are trying to roll this out to all 300 of those campaigns that you saw on the map um, that, that Kenya showed, making sure that our organizers have access to these resources. And what we're doing now is we're in the process of changing our campaign goals. So when you look back to um, our um, campaign goals that Kenya went over, will actually be for all new campaigns requiring for the um, build your team piece, which does go across all four of our campaign types um, that you have read these resources and that you have um, that you have um, you know made sure that you are building your committee and your team with these resources around inclusion in mind and these resources around diversity in mind. So that's one of the pieces. The other thing is around events. So we're asking now all of our new campaigns to have partnered with at least one um, organization um, that is focused on, oh, thanks Holly, um, that is focused on um, racial justice. So if you're on a campus, that could be you know a student organization that's working alongside you. Um, you know, to advocate for racial justice. It could be, you know, the, um, you know, multicultural club on campus in a lot of our towns and cities. Um, we're finding that that's a lot of grassroots organizers that are um, working with Black Lives Matter. So again, how do we ensure that our campaigns are being um, encouraged and incentivized to partner with other groups um, where that makes sense? So that's one of the ways that we're, we're currently getting that um, rolling. We have to change the back end of the website and some of the, the requirements around our, our campaign pages um, in order to make that a reality. So like each of our campaigns has um, their own page. And you know, in order to achieve the goals, you, uh, let me just pull up Los Angeles as an example. Um, 
you uh, add the information on your, your campaign page here. So we're in the process of changing the back end to be able to, to have these requirements around commitments to racial justice. So it'll be a little bit longer, um, but that is the end goal. So the ones that I'll take you through are um, racial justice 101 and fair trade. So we've had a suite of 101s that we call them, um, just like digestible fact sheets, easy to, to distribute and share out talking points. So we did one on fair trade and racial justice. Um, and then our advocacy guide here was another really great piece that a fellow designed for us. Some talking points um, and, and real, um, you know, kind of deeper uh, insights from, um, again, that team of fellows at the time around how to engage authentically um, with other groups and how to align with racial justice efforts in a way that, um, you know, it can really facilitate longer term partnerships and not just looking at it as kind of short term leveraging the moment. Our national conference, Kenya mentioned, we went online last year in 2020, but the previous years we were in person and we've had, um, a focus on um, diversity and inclusion and racial justice as a track, a program track at the conference. So what this does here is um, goes into detail around what those sessions are and gives some discussion questions. And then we have um, at the beginning of the year last spring, we had a, a list running just of like different racial justice resources for fair trade advocates, ways to frame racial justice and fair trade. And then we also um, developed with one of our fellows a, a suite of um, social media graphics so that campaigns could, could post and share their own stories and their own commitments to, to racial justice. So I'll just pull these up and won't spend too much time on them, but just to kind of show you what they look like. So we have some facts here, the need for fair trade, and then some talking points around fair trade and racial justice. Um, and a path forward and kind of where we see this going with a link to, to the hub. So this is something that like a campaign would include at their tabling event, um, you know, if they wanted to have some talking points around this. The advocacy guide, um, this is something that again, you know, we really worked on this piece here specifically around how to align fair trade values and racial justice. So a lot of these points here, um, we wanna keep embedding into our work and, really making sure that we're finding ways to get this information out there um, that are um, you know, supportive of the efforts already happening and also um, are really being um, uh, uh, you know, considered not as a way to um, like criticize or judge campaigns for the way that they're organizing now or you know, maybe that they have been less diverse or less inclusive, but asking them to think about ways to change and moving forward and how, to, how we can all do better. So um, this why should fair traders care? And then when in racial justice discussions, just some talking points and best practices for our advocates to be able to take to their team meetings, to be able to take to their, um, you know, their, their campaign events. And then, like I said, we have the 18 and 19 and then 20 national conferences. So we have different scholars, um, community leaders that have spoken with links to their sessions and then um, some quotes and graphics that folks can share out. And then this is the crowdsource list that we started. Um, so this is something that uh, we were using in collaboration with our campaigns across the country and anyone could just add to it um, a particular focus here on how to support um, um, people of color owned businesses um, in, in these cities where we have these major campaigns, um, as well as actions that folks could take in webinars and trainings. And then these are just our social media assets um, that we offered to campaigns. Let me get back to the PowerPoint here. So yeah, it's our resource hub and that's a lot of the work that we've done um, to date. And again, you know, in the chat or, or um, you know, unmute and, and share, but we'd love to um, hear some of your just initial thoughts on a couple of these questions that Holly and Kenya and I came up with. First one, what links can be drawn between environmental racism and climate justice struggles of communities in the US and our farming and producer communities and partners abroad? 
And then how can we better support racial justice efforts through our campaigns? So if anyone has any specific ideas or feedback on some of the resources that we showed, um, we would welcome those as well. And you know, since we are a small group, if there's not a ton of uh, direct replies to this, we can always um, consider these for later too. And Kenya and or Holly, I still can't see the chat. So if anything did come through, um, feel free to go ahead and read it out. I do see a couple chats came through. Are they questions or replies to some of ours here? It looks like our time may be overlapping with another session. Um, so we had a couple people drop so they could head to another session. Gotcha. Well, we'll put a pin in these, um, but you know, again, for folks that are watching the session later on, um, if you do have some thoughts, um, particularly around this second question, after seeing us run through some of our resources, we'll have our contact at the end and we would love to continue the conversation there. And with that, I will hand it over to Kenya, who's been doing a ton of work um, on connecting fair trade to another um, really important issue that we're trying to um, do a lot more amplification around, which of course is climate justice. and and why we're so happy to be here uh, with the PowerShift team. Yeah, so um, with Fairtrade, they have a sustainability 101 that they created a couple years ago, I believe in 2017. Um, and this 101 just starts out with um, some fast facts about um, you know, poverty and food insecurity globally um, and how climate change has affected people uh, and these numbers uh, drastically. Um, and then how fair trade um, can help combat that or help not pause climate change, but um, make sure that our initiatives and our standards are keeping up to date with these changes that we will be seeing. Um, and so what I've been focused on for the past month is updating this knowledge that we have created um, a couple of years ago and um, how we can tie this more into not just um, how our climate is changing, but uh, climate justice as well. Um, and so um, maybe creating a hub like our racial hub um, for all things environmental, all things sustainable, um, but also acknowledging that climate change um, is drastically um, impacting um, indigenous people um, and uh, native people and people of color um, more than um, any other um, group. Um, and so we just wanna make sure that inclusivity is key. Um, and so I guess the next question um, or discussions for you guys is, you know, how we can do this. And I know Holly will um, talk more about this later, but yeah, so this is what um, I was speaking on. Um, and yeah, and so what, like, it's what, um, what we have. So right here, you have the fast facts. Um, right now it says, you know, the first one, 75% um, of the world's poor and food insecure people rely on agriculture and natural resources for their livelihoods. Um, since this was written a couple of years ago, that number has probably changed. Um, and unfortunately it's probably increased. 
Um, so we want to make sure that those numbers are all accurate. Um, and then as we go down, it talks more about fair trade and environmental sustainability. Um, and so how we give fair prices and how we um, keep to these standards and regulations um, and how that helps our campaigns globally. Um, and you know, this is creating a space, um, a safe space for um, agrochemicals, um, biodiversity and greenhouse gas emissions, um, and then our pests and waste management as well. Um, and if you'll scroll down a little bit more, Kylie, um, it talks more about climate change, but also focuses more on you know soil and water, pesticides, our waste, our GMOs, um, and this is what we're trying to control whenever we put these standards in. Um, so limiting our water use, um, sourcing our water sustainably, um, developing countries have a large problem um, with clean water, access to clean water um, from pollution and from climate change. Um, and then with pesticides, waste, um, and GMOs, um, how can we control our pests sustainably, um, uh, not using you know, massive amounts of pesticides that will destroy the crops um, and destroy the environment um, for the um, people there. Um, and then we, at the bottom, uh, kind of promote um, our fair trade premium projects um, that I think Kylie mentioned earlier. Um, so just one is, you know, in Kenya, members of the tea cooperative um, have used premium funds to establish tree nurseries and providing training on organic uh, composting, uh, diversification and reducing deforestation, which these are all major things that climate change um, will be impacting or is impacting currently. Um, and so with those, um, what's the word I'm looking for? With those premium funds, um, this will help uh, combat climate change. So, Carly, if you want to go to the discussion questions, we can kind of go a little bit more in depth. Um, and Holly, I don't know if you want to field these questions. Yeah, I don't know if we'll spend too much time on the actual discussion portion, just because there's only a few folks left. Um, but these are some questions that we are striving to kind of get new ideas for and get answers to from everyone who's involved in also folks who just aren't super involved with fair trade campaigns to begin with. Um, so whether or not the folks in the session have anything to add, um, I think even for recording sake, it would be great to just kind of get these questions out and see who can answer. Um, but first is how does and how can fair trade better help combat environmental racism and bring food justice to farming and producer communities abroad? Um, I think that's pretty important just because fair trade as a concept helps um, farmers and producers from all over the world. And I think a lot of times people think very locally, um, which is quite good in the movement of sustainability, but also if you're going to buy coffee, places in the US really aren't you know, gonna supply that. So it's always good to think globally. Um, second question, how can we draw better connections between fair trade and climate justice? And third, how can we rewrite our sustainability resources to be more progressive and up to date? So that's basically referring to what Kenya just went over. Um, a lot of those documents, and we have so many resources on our website, even apart from just being a campaign, um, but those are all working documents and we strive to change them over time. But I think sometimes just with the sheer number of them, um, they kind of fall to the wayside. So we're always looking um, for more ideas and just ways to kind of better those things. Um, and then Kylie, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Yeah. So if any of this interests you, um, you can definitely start a campaign with wherever you are. Um, again, the four types are towns, congregations, um, colleges and universities and schools. So wherever you are, are um, you can always start a campaign and you can just go straight to our website and you can also get connected with us through any of our social media channels we do have events coming up and they're not always just for our campaigners 
And if you're looking to reach out directly, we have our email addresses linked in the bottom there. And you can just give us a quick email and we'll help you out with whatever you need. Awesome. And I'm going to leave this slide up um, as we as we wrap up just so that folks can can make sure to get some of this information. Um, but I would just like to, to wrap up by thanking both Kenya and Holly for, for co presenting with me today. Um, I, it was great to have your your voices um, and to Akila and the PowerShift Network and all you've done to coordinate this great week of, um, yeah, of, of, you know, movement building and, and power shifting sessions. Um, been uh, a lot of programming and I know a lot of hard work so well done and you definitely reach out don't hesitate to to contact us we'd love to work with you if not on a campaign even just to answer your questions um, and to stay in touch 